a large part of the market is driven by buyers who need to localize, translate, to comply with laws, regulations. We are seeing or we're projecting like an 8 to 10% pickup in growth in 2021. Within Babel, they could scale linearly their customer service operation. And not only they were able to scale, but actually reduced from 48 hours average first response to 12 hours. And welcome to Slater Pod 71. Hi there, Esther. Hey, Florian. How are you doing? All good. All good. Fantastic guest today. We are speaking to Vasco Pedro, the CEO of Unbobble, the AI agency and probably one of the most uh, tech-driven companies in the entire industry. So, yeah. Vasco, exciting. upcoming in 30 minutes, if you stick through this first segment. So I uh, promise you it's going to be a super interesting discussion. This is a big week for us, Esther. Why? Ooh, lots of reasons. Uh, well, we have SlaterCon Remote coming up on Thursday of this week, and we are launching the 2021 Language Industry Market Report. All is in one week. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Is it is it a concise, short summary of what's going on? Um, I mean, I'd say it's concise given the amount of things that are going on. Uh, but no, this is a bit of a bumper report, I think, by our standards. So it's eight, 80 pages in total, 70 pages in the main body of the report, and 10 extra data type pages in appendices. So we keep uh, we keep expanding. I think the last one was what, 45 or 50? Now we're I think it's 55 in the end on the PDF, yeah. But we've added, yeah. you know, well, I think we'll talk about this, but we've added some, some good levels of analysis and, uh, yeah, comments, insights on the industry. Fantastic. I read it. It's amazing. Go get it. It's, uh, as we said, 80 pages. Probably at some point we should probably produce a print version, <laughs> make a book out of it. Uh, definitely layout's amazing, and you guys have done a, a, a really good job doing this. So... Today, we are going to go through uh, some of the key points from the report. Um, you know, there's a lot of new stuff that we, uh, we, we put in there, kind of a, a few new ways of uh, looking at the industry. And of course, uh, tons and tons of data, which we're not going to go through all of it because it's 80 pages and there's a lot of data, but we just want to, uh, you know, point you to some of the highlights there. Uh, also, today's M&A week, we're drowning in M&A uh, stories to follow. So, uh, you know, for anybody who's not into M&A, apologies. We're kind of busy on uh, all of these deals that are happening left, right, and center. So we're going to mention a few of them. Um, so what's the total market size of the global language industry? Esther, what, what, what do we say for 2020? Well, 2020, which is now passed, uh, we size the market at 23.8 billion. So it's very slightly shrunk in comparison to 2019, um, which I think is an amazing job and proof of a very resilient industry. Uh, and largely, I think, as we've mentioned before, due to the industry having a really incredible bounce back in, in the second half, which is ongoing into 2021. So we, yeah, so basically it didn't grow, but, you know, first half was basically falling off a cliff, especially, of course, in the second, uh, in the second quarter where in, in a lot of areas, yeah. uh, you know, things just stopped, but then came roaring back. And uh, as you said, we were still, we were still slightly down by, you know, probably one or what is it like one or 2% down it's like 1.5 around yeah. that 1.5% on the year before. But I think we've, all, we've almost certainly more than made up for that in the first few months of 2021. Absolutely. Um, so we are I mean, forecasting a very strong 2021. And beyond. Very, very strong. Very strong. I mean, this is the super cycle theory, which I'm going to uh, be talking about um, on, well, tomorrow, for those listening to this on Friday, yesterday, the usual thing, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and so we are seeing or we're projecting like an 8 to 10% pickup in growth in, in 2021. Some of this is kind of the base effect, of course. But uh, mm -hmm. this is it's going to be a really strong year. Lots of uh, lots of good stories. Also, anecdotal evidence coming out from uh, people that we're speaking to about great first quarters, strong second quarters. And, you know, I mean, things are if you look at the, the kind of the macro economy, it's, it's slowing down a little bit. There's all these inflation concerns, et cetera. But uh, mm -hmm. for for the language industry, it's 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 going really, really well at the moment. Um, 
And then the longer term projection is always hard to do, but I think we're, we are projecting it's, it's kind of reverting to its mean, you know, four, five, six percent trend growth over the, yeah. the next uh, three years, which puts it at, uh, at $30 billion in 2024, which is a lot of business. And yeah. when we're uh, talking about this number with, you know, investors, uh, advisors, and, and LSP uh, uh, people, um, the key question is always like, why are we, um, I mean, our figure is somewhat lower than competing figures, mm. but that's could be, and just to get this out of the way, this could be, by the way, we're just slicing and dicing the market. I mean, we are only looking at, you know, translation, localization, related services and not adjacent things like, you know, DTP and like there's a whole list of things you could potentially add to this. So, mm -hmm. I mean, th then you almost have to ask yeah. the question, you know, where does it stop? Like, wh you know, DTP and then what staffing of DTP would still be language industry, et cetera. So we're, yeah. we're maybe drawing the circle a little more uh, narrowly than others. So top three insights in terms of looking at vertical. We, we had a deep, deep vertical analysis there in terms of the client verticals. Uh, can you just give us like the top three? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the ones that are pretty interesting to look at, um, technology, uh, which I think comes as no surprise, it grew pretty strongly and continues to grow. Um, I mean, the main reason behind that is just tech, tech is a tech's growing language localization for tech is also growing um, particularly in 2020 when you know you had a, a, a big well big remote push and also lots of SaaS getting traction along with the continuing role of, of big tech as well um, I think what one segment that's also interesting to call out is media localization which I think long term or medium term even has a very high growth prospects but had a really rough time in 2020 really due to the kind of operational and production issues that covid brought about so i think we've discussed numerous times dubbing studios were closed on the supplier side also hollywood productions etc movie sets were not able to go ahead as planned so that had a bit of a bumpy time in 2020 but long term and, and certainly this year and um, project forecasts are, are looking good um, and yeah, engineering and manufacturing. So this sort of hard physical uh, manual part of the industry um, down uh, around 10% from 2019. Um, and I think we did observe some real extreme disruption to this segment in, in the first half of 2020, as you said, but um, also, yeah, bouncing back super strongly already. Yeah, it has already. I mean, if you look at the, I mean, th th I guess that's where par part of the inflation is coming from. I mean, there's a lot of uh, demand for kind of raw materials, et cetera, from, from that space. And if you look at mm -hmm. the, you know, some of the car manufacturers that are just going through the roof at the moment, not just Tesla, uh, I mean, like Volkswagen is, is, uh, is really uh, doing, doing really well. So this, this has bounced back. Uh, so that's promising for all those tech doc uh, LSPs. Uh, you know, yeah. also especially here in, in, in Southern Germany, et cetera. Uh, in terms of the LSP performance, we, we, we don't have to rehash that. We went through it in, when we discussed the LSPI, but yeah, uh, I think it was somewhat, um, it, I think if there's one takeaway here and, and that's more going for like the end of the year plus Q1, I think uh, that the, the big super agencies are really doing really well. I mean, we had, Transperfect's blowout first quarter, RWS is doing mm. well. Generally, this is kind of just a secular trend towards global procurement that they, they keep on centralizing things, keep on, uh, yeah, I mean, just going from having 10, 20, 30 vendors globally to just kind of, you know, going into these bigger framework agreements and, and having one or two uh, key key vendors. Like we also discussed, did we discuss the Sweden one where they went from three to, to one? Yeah, I think I we think did. We last... might have talked about that last week. Yeah. Yeah, last week. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So even the the some of the governments are going uh, single vendor there. Mm. Now, drum roll. There's two new things in the okay. 2021 uh, <laughs> 2021 report. One is we actually sized up the market in terms of geographies, mm -hmm. and we launched a new intention framework. So yeah. let's first talk about, well, so, so slice and dice the market uh, according to buyer intention, but first geography, obviously we're not going to rattle off all of the figures. That's what the report's for, but let's just highlight two of the, I mean, basically the two dominant 
um, uh, regions here. So can you just tell us a bit more about that? Yeah. So as you said, we sized by in a number of geographical ways. So we, we did, uh, I think, seven, eight regions of the world. We spliced and diced it like that and then did also market size for G20 countries plus Norway and Switzerland. So yes, if you're interested, grab the report. Um, but in terms of the two dominant regions, um, North America, uh, probably no surprise, uh, we sized that at around $9.1 billion uh, dollars in 2020. Um, and I think you will see that from a lot of LSPs, uh, client base. Um, there are a lot of Fortune 500 powerhouses, uh, obviously, in the US, uh, a lot of global, a lot of tech, um, and a lot of language access from the government as well. So huge, huge, huge market. Um, and that you know, not just the US, but that's the, the, the entire region. The US counts for a significant portion of that. Um, Europe, uh, kind of a close second at uh, $8.6 billion in 2020. Um, very different dynamics, I'd say, from um, North America. Um, I mean, there's less kind of massive monster big tech spend, but uh, there's a lot of different markets, lots of different languages, um, also very big exporters. Uh, so you get intra-Europe uh, spend as well across borders and uh, within within countries for to account for multilingualism um, and then Asia um, definitely smaller um, but it's super strong at the moment and and growing um, so you've got less maturity uh, maybe you can talk about Asia since Still, you uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah sorry you're I mean, so, an Asian specialist yeah yeah so there I mean Asia is is, is this is a strong region, but not it doesn't correlate yet in terms of the mm. the language industry or localization spend with GDP. I mean, if you look at Asian GDP, it's I, I don't have the number handy, but like I don't know thirty forty percent of global GDP. So it's not matching up. It's cloud in terms of GDP versus localization spend, right? But mm. I think there's two factors here. A, it's still I mean, there's there's big countries that are uh, still developing very rapidly. I mean, I could argue China is basically getting to develop country status now. I mean, some of the Chinese cities are obviously more developed than many other European and, <laughs> and maybe US cities, right? But there's mm. still a vast uh, vast territory outside of the big tier one, tier two cities in China. Anyway, so um, it's still a little less mature, but then also there's probably some leapfrogging going on where like there's no entrenched 20 year old localization supply chain, but they jump right into- They're gonna like, bypass, bypass yeah, they're gonna bypass what we went through, yeah. And just go straight into the kind of automation expert in the loop model, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, interesting. I mean, Europe is also interesting that you, you'd probably think that Europe may account for bigger uh, a bigger portion of the spend, but um, it's just that the technology uh, vertical is just so large and, and, the and it just attracts there's just so much localization in that space uh, mm -hmm. that, that Europe just doesn't have. So you have the exports, kind of the export manufacturer make up some of it, but... Um, uh, but not not all of it, and then the inter-European spend, obviously, is 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 accounting for a big portion of that. Mm -hmm. um, buyer intention framework sounds complicated, but super interesting. Mm -hmm. What is it? Well, it was quite complicated, but it's quite simple if you boil it down. So it's the reasons why, or the motivations behind why buyers are doing translation, localization, interpreting, etc. Let me just pause you there. So yes. the reason why buyers localize or translate, and what we did was we applied a number to this, right? So we looked at the total spend, the mm -hmm. $24 billion, and then we allocated it to how many is it? Nine or? I think it's nine. Yeah. Across to nine, nine different, different intentions. Drivers, intentions. Yeah. You yeah. can use different words. We went with intentions. So, so basically now we have three ways of splitting the market. First, we, got, we, mm. we, we divide the market, the $24 billion, into the verticals. So that's like life yeah. sciences, manufacturing, you know, public sector. The second one, we um, divided it into by, by geography, which we just discussed. And now the third one also new is the intention. So mm -hmm. what are the nine intentions? What are the nine intentions? Yeah, so we have uh, accessing a market. I, d I don't know if this needs explanation, but uh, the, no. uh, the reason would be... Let's just go know? through. I mean, there's a lot of... Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Maybe we can unpack some of them if they're less, uh, less transparent. But yeah, buyers buy localization and translation in order to access a market. 
um, also to acquire customers in in different countries and cultures, etc. So this would be things relating to sales, customer facing materials, etc. Um, in addition to wanting to acquire customers, they also localize and translate in order to retain their customers. And so things like customer engagement, customer retention strategies. Um, and a big one, uh, which maybe is less exciting for some people, is complying with regulations. So yes, a lot, a large part of the market is is driven by buyers who need to localize, translate to comply with laws, regulations, etc. Um, you also have the rationale or the intention of of managing people. So this would be things like corporate internal corporate materials that actual global you know, enterprise buyers need to localize just even to communicate with with their staff um, and kind of related to that managing processes um, so this is localizing key key materials um, so you know you'd have things like uh, process well, workflows um, lots of different things relating to the way that you do business yeah right. like let's way- say you want to inst- you want to kind of build or construct the big new plant in a, in a different country. You need to make sure mm-hmm. that the, the, you know, the workers on site, the, the engineers can really build it. So yeah, yeah so that's just like standard one, operating procedures. Yeah. And exactly. All stuff sorts like that. Of different yeah. content types. Yeah. Um, another, another intention is to monitor events and reactions. Um, so we kind of came up with this, uh, this category, uh, to look at things like, you know, monitoring brands. This would be monitoring brands, monitoring product performance, uh, monitoring risks associated to the business or public. Um, and you have, yeah, a lot, a lot of volume, I think, and a lot of monitoring that's actually going on by, you know, government, public, um, private companies also. Uh, then there's enabling public access. Um, so, I mean, this would be primarily associated if you're mapping this on a vertical basis, which we also did in the report. Um, it would be a, an intention that's primarily associated with, you know, public sector um, or with with defence um, buyers as well. Um, but it's a need to drive the pub. Uh, it's a need to provide the public with information in locally in in their local languages. And, and the, final the final one, one yeah. is Sorry. discovery. <laughs> Uh, which sounds great. Uh, I like that. <laughs> but basically, yeah, you're, this is where buyers are using translation uh, for to discover uh, whatever it is that they're looking for, they want to uncover. So this, for example, in litigation, uh, you have the whole e-discovery uh, sort of sector. Um, you want to identify rel- content that's relevant for research. You know, maybe there's some, some of that happening in, in patents and things as well. Um, and yeah, typically very high volume, but I think very susceptible here to machine translation and, and MTPE as well. Absolutely. So yeah, do get the report to really mm. draw, you know, get also get, get the figures here. And mm. the, the reason why we did this is because we want to give LSPs and, and buyers also, or especially LSPs for this particular one, a new framework of, um, thinking about. Um, well, actually for both, right? If you're from the LSP, you want to have a, you have a new framework of, of, of talking to clients. Like, why are you doing this, right? Mm. And, uh, and, and look, this is a sizable portion. A lot of others are doing this as well. This is the same aim. Uh, and then for, for the buyers, it, it helps uh, justify some of the ROI discussions, you know, mm. uh, internally and just make sure that, uh, you know, probably senior management understands, well, this is, this is a big part of, why people buy these types of services, right? So I guess one of the biggest ones here is accessing a market, which was the very first that we we spoke about, right? I mean, if you do yeah. not, it's the the ancient discussion. If you don't localize the product, I mean, no one's going to be able to buy it. Which obviously goes back to the Canva discussion we had podcast two weeks ago. Mm. You know, if Canva if Canva doesn't have any localized templates, it's going to be hard yeah. to get you know Germans and and Chinese uh, to use it and. Um, yeah, so that that that's those are the nine intentions, and yeah. really proud. I think this is a fantastic new addition to our uh, general research framework, which we're going to be yeah. using uh, going forward. Cool. Get the report. There will be a briefing in about three weeks' time for all the report buyers and the strategy package subscribers. So go get it. the The, the briefing will be complimentary uh, to to anybody who buys it. Uh, the report. So. It's going to be great. 
M and A week. Yeah. Go, let's go through this. So <laughs> we had big language solutions buying um, language link, Propio language services acquired Vocalink, and Jetronet bought Lingo World. So that that is a lot of Ling Voca. <laughs> <laughs> Lang. <laughs> Ling anyway, Lang. Yeah. Ling Lang. <laughs> Ling Lang Ling. So starting off with Big Language Solutions, uh, Jeff Brink, CEO of Big. Uh, you know, it's the group of companies funded by private equity in the US. They closed their mm. third big deal. Um, they, they bought Pro Translating in Florida, then they bought ISI, and now they acquired uh, a $27 million OPI provider, uh, over the phone interpreting, RSI interpreting, provider language link, formerly known mm -hmm. as CTS, Corporate Translation Services. Um, they closed the deal end of April. Details weren't disclosed, but, you know, given the growth of um, language link, this probably wasn't the, the cheapest acquisition because they grew. They were one of the very few uh, in our leader category uh, I think mm. among the leader, they were the fastest growing in the 2021 LSPI. So again, they ended okay. up, uh, they grew 55% in 2020. They ended the, the year at $27.5 million. They do over the phone interpreting, video remote interpreting. Um, and so Jeff Brink, the CEO of Big said, well, this is a transformative big deal for us. It kind of, he says it elevates them into the group of, of LSPs that generate 25 million or over at least 25 million in revenues from both translation and interpreting services. So balanced, um, mm. balanced LSP. And they, they're, they're not going to rebrand, so they're going to keep the brand under and just co-brand it as kind of a big language company. So language mm -hmm. will stay, and then on top of it, uh, a big language company. It's interesting backstory. Let me just share that. Uh, shows the tenacity that you need sometimes to close deals. So so Brink told us that, that they approached uh, Jeff Barger, who who's the sole owner of language um, uh, link in in 2018 they, they they'd known each other for for many years before um and then discussions stalled um uh, or sorry yeah no initially Brink said there was a strategic fit even better than he expected so they started putting in they uh, started really fast tracking the due diligence but then it, it paused and then in in early april i think this year uh barger decided to hit pause again um mm -hmm. and said and as Brink put it, uh, we quoted in there, letting your baby go is not easy. And and then they went to, uh, so Jeff Barcher went to Hawaii. Uh -huh. And then the very next day, uh, uh, Jeff Brink and uh, big CFO, they followed him also, there. <laughs> they followed him. So they, f they also flew to Hawaii. You can't run uh, away. <laughs> no, you can't run away. And then uh, Jeff Brink told us that uh, they spent a full three days together and they got the deal back on track. So mm. um, yeah. And had a great time in Hawaii, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Of course. And then uh, we, uh, we we quote Jeff Barcher saying, I was so impressed by uh, Brink's tenacity, honesty, and desire to get the deal done. So he knew joining forces was in their best interest and they weren't, they, and you weren't leaving the island without a renewed commitment. So, hey, I'm here, you know, I'm here. Like, let's, let's, let's talk through this. But it shows that it's really also in M&A, it's a lot about interpersonal uh, connections mm. there as well and it's about nurturing this uh, until the very end so this uh it's it's quite an episode and i also appreciate that this is uh you know on the record uh from jeff brink i mean yeah. that's, that's kind of an unusual personal note in a in a what usually are relatively dry m a stories so <laughs> good episode there close this i and next one also us uh yep. proprio language services acquires what? uh translation interpreting provider vocalink yeah, also US also heavily skewed towards interpreting um, this this well combined company and also the deal. Uh, but we had Prop Propio um, who acquired Vocalink, as you said. Uh, the Vocalink founder wa wanted to re retire. Um, they are Propio was around fifteen million US dollars in twenty twenty, and they did manage um, a small small growth around three percent in twenty twenty. So again, um, yeah, did pretty well all things considered. Um, they're forecasting super strong growth in in twenty twenty one, and also said, um, you know, consistent with with what we've been saying that the first five months or four or five months of the year twenty twenty one have been incredibly strong. Um, they said that. They, that COVID had accelerated the need um, and the adoption of remote solutions as it pertains to interpreting. 
Um, and their CEO, Marco Assis, told us that they had seen incredible growth with remote services and there are no signs of slowing down. So there no we go. No signs of slowing down. Uh, mm -hmm. Things are also busy in Germany. So Chetronet bought Lingua World. Yeah, you're calling it Jetronet. My in, my mind, in my mind, I thought it was Getronet. Well, we can call Could it be Ger Getronet. Like Germany. I suppose it's well, like, it, this is yeah. the German translation network abbreviated right. and also branded as, all right, I'll go for Jetronet. There we go. Um, yeah, so another acquisition um, in for them. And yeah, if they weren't on, on your radar, that they, they definitely will be now. I mean, when we spoke to them, they told us they had a 15-year history of M&A uh, in Germany. So probably a fair few number of deals there that we uh, <laughs> maybe missed out over the past couple of years. Um, but yeah, Jetronet is part of a bigger group called GTN Group. And that group is a family-owned business, which has two divisions one language services, which is Jetronet, and another which focuses on digital information. Um, so the Jetronet arm, the language services arm, has uh, six different brands. Um, but they told us they'd done they'd acquired a good dozen companies in the LSP sector. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, look, what, uh, maybe, exactly maybe we should set up a few uh, German keywords there that I can. Uh, <laughs> go through. But no, but generally, yeah. I got to say it's. It's a cultural thing because mm. in, in Switzerland, especially in Germany, they're very reticent to publish announce. things, yeah. announce. They, the, mm. the, the concept of like issuing a press release is is quite, I mean, it's just Anglo. not part of the culture. <laughs> it's like, you know, you're you're selling your company to somebody, like you're not going to make a press release about it, mm. it, it under if you're uh, typically under a certain size. So it yeah. makes a lot of sense. And I think, yeah, I mean, th th they said, I think this is, well, I mean, actually, they didn't comment on the size, um, but I mean, just to give a bit of perspective, they said that the combined company is 67 people post acquisition, um, and typic and around uh, 15 to 16 million um, in 2021. So that's their forecasts. Um, so if they've wow. if they've done sort of 12 plus, then they're they're going to all all have been fairly fairly small deals. Um, Let's put yeah. them on the map now. So we will well, put them on the map. Yeah, exactly. Welcome to Slater this coverage, Jetronet. It's an interesting one. I mean, his, the, we spoke to um, their chief innovation officer, Tom Jordi Roish, um, who was telling us a little bit about their, their acquisition strategy, um, basically saying that they sometimes retain the brand for larger acquisitions and um, typically sort of uh, consolidate the smaller ones into existing structures. This was also the product of a, of a retirement, I think I, I, think I mentioned. Um, Got it. And they said this is the start of a new chapter and they're planning now to focus on build part of the buy and build M&A strategy. No more deals. Build. Perhaps not. Uh, back to buy. Verbit. Verbit. <laughs> uh, transcription. Raised 60 million in Series C back in 2020. Fast forward. Well, the, the, the strategy there was um, doing more M&A. Fast forward back to 2021 and boom, they bought a, the largest provider of co closed captioning in the US called Vitek. Yeah. Uh, so Verbit's based in New York. They got a big presence in Israel. I, they might have originated in Israel, but then moved over to New York, but I don't, I don't know for sure. Uh, quite large, has 200 plus staff, um, uh, full time. That's pre-acquisition of Vitek. They got a 22,000 transcribers, like freelancers. So, you know, similar to the translation model, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. They have this, uh, they run this AI agency model, like human in the loop transcription captioning model. Now, in terms of size, Vitek says they caption like 300,000 live program hours per year, uh, 57,000 pre-recorded programs. I got this off Wikipedia, so I don't know how... Um, how how current this is, but you know, it's, it's a big player. Transcription mm -hmm. generally as smaller than localization translation, two to $4 billion a year, if I remember correctly, but of course mm -hmm. getting super, super techie with all the speech to text, text to speech. Uh, you know, if anybody's interested, go back to the paper cup um, discussion uh, with, yeah. uh, you know, when we talked about uh, these types of technology still, there is apparently a, a lot of smaller kind of mom and pop shops in the transcription space. Now, Key takeaway here is, without going to further analysis, um, but the key takeaway for me is that these AI agencies, and Verbit is one of those, 
mm. are starting to do M and A. So in order to accelerate, kind of into those slower to adopt client segments, it's it's hard, right? You're this cool, new, shiny, uh, tech driven startup y company, and then you're going to all of these smaller accounts. It's it's just hard to. It, there's a lot of cost of sales um, mm. unless you have an absolutely compelling solution. Um, um, still, if it's it's kind of a more custom sale, it's just hard. So. So yeah, so they're going into these, uh, they're, they're doing M&A, which mm. is, it's interesting. And this also segues super nicely to Unbubble, now that we're going to talk to Vasco, because Unbubble recently hired a CFO whose job scope includes M&A. Mm -hmm. So let's ask Vasco all about this and a ton of other things. So let's do it. Catch you soon. And welcome back to Slater Pod. Today we have a very special guest joining us today is Vasco Pedro, CEO of Unbubble. Hi, Vasco. Hi, Florian. Great to be here. Thank you for the invite. Absolutely. Hey, Vasco, where does this podcast find you today? Well, today I am in Lisbon, uh, more specifically in our new Lisbon office, uh, which is a pretty amazing office that, you know, it's probably the most amazing empty office in Lisbon right now, given COVID. <laughs> Uh, but it's specific women that I, I'm in one of our theme rooms, and this is kind of slightly Asian Chinese themes. Um, some of the furniture you see behind me actually came from a Chinese restaurant that had this old furniture and is quite quirky and, and fun. Yeah, we were we we're saying that before before we started recording. This is probably the the, the top background uh, uh, Zoom background game it's you, definitely got, you got up going there. on here. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> definitely up there. Yeah, and we'll we, I I need to get this set up as well, especially the video. So uh, so first up, tell us tell us about Unbobble company in a nutshell. What's kind of the the elevator pitch just to get this started? So. Uh, you know, most companies, there's a, there's a very simple insight uh, that I think will be very obvious for you guys, uh, which is everyone in the world speaks a language. Most of the people speak different languages, right? And and it's not going to happen that everyone speaks the same language or that we all speak all languages. So this this fundamental problem of different languages is, is a thing, is going to continue to be a thing. And the problem is that as a company, as you scale and you start selling your goods and services in other markets, you start you know, facing issues that come from the fact that people speak different languages. And those issues occur across the entire company. And so what we, uh, what we do at Unbabel is we're building a language operations platform um, that at the base combines artificial intelligence and human translation to enable companies to scale across languages throughout you know, the different areas of the company. Um, that's kind of the idea. Got it. So many people know you can afford it to technology, like you're building, you got, you know, the venture funding, which we'll talk about later, you know, we, we call you like this uh, AI agency, we put that label on top. So can you just break the tech down a little bit to start with for kind of the non tech people among our audience? Like what's at the core of Unbobble in terms of the technology? Yeah, certainly. So um, we we started in Babel in 2013. And, uh, you know, a lot of times, it, it, timing uh, is a bit about luck. And I think, in our case was, right at the edge when, when artificial intelligence was starting to be useful for uh, translation. You know, I think if you started a few years before, you would put the output of a machine translation engine on, in front of a translator, and the first thing they would do is they would erase everything. And right around that time is when you start having machine translation that starts being useful enough that people are like, oh, actually, this helps. And that was one of the core insights is, well, until now, solving language issues is primarily a human effort. Now that AI is starting to have an impact, how does the future look like from an AI first perspective? Right. And there was, uh, if, if you think about a translation pipeline, there were some very obvious first places to apply AI, one machine translation, uh, but actually extends throughout all of the different functions. So what I mean by this is, uh, at the core of Mbabel, there's a translation pipeline. This this pipeline works, you know, in a simplified manner as, as follows. So you have First, a machine translation engine that is built by us, is customized, is customer adapted, you know, as it's continuously evolving, not at this point is obviously deep learning based, et cetera. Then after that, there's a piece of technology that uh, we've built over the years. It's also deep learning based, it's quality estimation. And so what that does is it's, it's a neural network that tries to make a real time decision on whether the output of the machine translation engine is good or if we need human intervention. 
And then if we, you know, if we, if, if the decision is that we need human intervention, then that gets sent uh, through a, a smart task routing algorithm to our community of translators. And then in turn, they work on um, AI powered CAD tools that we've built. So um, that incorporate things like, um, you know, not just the, the typical uh, grammar and spelling and so on, but things like how to incorporate glossaries inside. How do you, are you able to say at a sentence level, which sentences we think are actually quite good. So don't touch this, but actually this other ones need, you know, for you to focus on, or, hey, you're using an informal tone, but actually this, for this particular translation, you should be using a formal tone and a bunch of other aids that make the translator life easier. Um, and then at the end of that, you know, then that's the output that gets sent to the, to the customer. And then the output of that also gets used to retrain all of the AI components. Uh, there's a few added metadata layers that happen after the fact, like annotations and a bunch of other things to understand and, and rate quality and different aspects of quality. And then the combination of that is really what feeds the different AI components. Hmm. And so these are all of the, the tools that you have at your disposal. Uh, and what what would you say that the top three challenges you're helping customers to serve with all of this right now? So what, what kind of functions and industries is Unbabble currently serving best? Um, so uh, part of the, the, the vision of Unbabble is this, I think it's based on this insight that one of the things that AI is going to do is, is going to really enable the, what we were seeing as a function of localization to increase in value and in strategic value across the company. And what I mean by this is, um, you know, if you think about it, localization primarily is focused on two of the sub areas of a company, typically marketing and product, uh, where, you know, it's like websites and marketing content and how do I get my users to, to be able to use my product. But as a company scales, you have issues in a bunch of different areas. Like how do I serve my customers in multiple languages? How do I sell my product in multiple languages? How do I enable, you know, internal communication? Those are all things mm -hmm. that every global organization feels until now dealing with you know it, the, the solutions for all of this uh, problems were kind of ad hoc and, and a bit siloed right so if you went to customer service you'd say well the only way to solve this is hire natives or if you're talking about sales well you not only have to hire natives but you probably have to hire people that are in location uh and and so and then you know if you go to marketing then you start getting to localization and there was all of this solutions for us, what we looked is from a holistic perspective, given that there's all this set of problems, where do we start, right? And um, and so for us, we felt that the right point to start was actually customer service. And there was a few reasons for mm -hmm. that, uh, from a technology perspective, from a, uh, being able to be in a, in a disruption market that typical localization couldn't handle and machine translation also couldn't handle. And so there was a, a really nice space there. And so what we actually do for the most part right now as a first use case is enabling companies to uh, provide multilingual customer support using translation as a layer, right? And typically, mm -hmm. so we, we are focused on text-based, so email and chat. And so what this does is, let's say that you have a team of, um, you know, customer service agents in, let's say, Germany, serving the German market, right? And that sometimes is not only very costly because, you know, the labor in Germany is expensive, but also a lot of times is customer service in Germany is not seen as a, as a, you know, a very rewarding career, right? And so you have a lot of turnover. Uh, you have uh, difficulties dealing with peaks. There's all of these challenges, right? And so what Unbabel enables you to do is say, okay, well, now I can serve this market from really anywhere, right? Just having a, maybe a, a contact center in Romania or Poland, or maybe I can do it from the Philippines. It doesn't really matter, right? I can actually aggregate, create centers of excellence, and then have those agents, let's say they speak English, we add Unbabel on top, and now every one of, that age, of those agents can support customers in 30 different languages. And the impact of this is quite interesting because not only you have the what you'd expect in terms of a cost reduction, but actually what we constantly see is an increase in customer satisfaction. So, and this comes from when you can use your workforce better. So you're not limited by, I only have three agents in German and three agents in French, but I have you know six agents that can handle everything. It means that typically you have a much faster time to first response. Like for example, so, uh, during COVID, Logitech grew quite a bit, right? Everyone's is buying webcams for Zoom. And so they suddenly have an explosion on customer service uh, requests. And in their, in their case, a lot of times they end up hiring engineers 
for the customer service, especially like tier two customer service to solve problems. And so hiring a bunch of engineers to deal with 300% growth on customer service requests in the time of COVID all over on the, the globe was pretty much impossible. And so what we helped them do is with Babel, they could scale linearly their customer service uh, operations. And not only they were able to scale, but actually reduced from 48 hours uh, average first response to 12 hours because they could use all their agents all the time. Right. So that's ends up being a very, you know, typical use case for us. Maybe you just shared that case study with Logitech. Like another question would be is are the direct users of this usually your target segment or is it kind of a second layer of like big contact centers that are itself dealing with the enterprise? Is that also a customer segment of yours or is it mostly directly with those enterprise clients? So for the most part, the relationships end up being direct with customers, but BPOs, uh, which typically have the large contact centers, are partners, right? So it, they are definitely very much involved in the process because they end up representing about 80% of all customer service, like goes through some agent that is in a contact center somewhere. And so they can also very much optimize a lot of their, uh, a lot of the flow. Um, it means that, mm. for example, it, it's very interesting because for them, it means that, for example, for someone in the Philippines, suddenly they increase in value, right? They say, look, until now, maybe we can only do English customer support, but now we can do 30 languages right, right from here. And so that means uh, an actual impact in the economy, which is quite, quite interesting. Got it. Yeah. That's super interesting. And I mean, help us to understand a bit more the, the journey. So you mentioned starting out in 2013. Uh, what was the trajectory like uh, to where the company is, is now? Well, I mean, so it's a lot of times it's, it's, it, you know, in the case of startups, it's easy to have hindsight and like, create this very smooth curve of like, oh, look, everything was so neatly planned from the beginning. But Paul Graham says something that is, I find is very true, which is all startups are shit shows. And so internally, <laughs> uh, and, and it's a bit like that, right? So you start out and you have um, you know, a problem you want to solve. And there's a lot you don't know, you don't know, right? So you go out and you start mm -hmm. doing things and hopefully you converge on a business model and the product uh, that, that gives you that beachhead, right? And for us, that was definitely in the beginning. So we, we started in 2013, uh, you know, in the beginning, we just wanted to prove out, hey, this, this whole idea of hybrid model of AI plus human, does it work? Is it valuable? Where is it valuable? Where can we actually apply it in a way that makes sense, right? And it took us probably, I would say, two or three years to it really build out the core components, the translation pipeline, the machine translation. Actually, in the beginning, a lot of the AI that like right, right in the beginning, we're like, actually, let's use third party uh, uh, tech for some of the AI components because we don't have bandwidth or resources to implement everything. Uh, and then it was uh, we did our Series A in 2016. And I think that was a, um, a shift, uh, a step change for us where we went from really trying to figure out what is that initial use case to identifying, hey, look, customer service seems to be that 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 beachhead, that initial use case that makes sense to us. Let's go out and really build out a sales team that that enables this, uh, and and let's go out and and continue to optimize and implement some of the core AI tech that we knew that we needed to develop. You know, that was uh, once you find that kind of initial use case, it's much easier to then build for it, right? Um, and then I would say. Probably, so we did our Series B in 2018 and then Series C in 2019. Uh, and I think that uh, it's kind of the phase that we're in. It's, uh, it's, um, we've, we've identified that initial use case. We've, we're, you know, becoming more and more dominant in it. Uh, but now it's the time to start really taking the platform and this whole concept of language operations to the next level, right? It's okay. Well, we've kind of proven that. We can really bring benefit on customer service. Now, what happens as we expand to other use cases within an organization? So in terms of the leadership team, I mean, this this needs a lot of different skills, of course, from like, you know, on the tech side, but also scaling the business then. And I once met Joao at a, at a conference uh, here in, in Switzerland, like uh, probably one of the last in-person conferences I went to in, in Lausanne, like an AI conference, very interesting. But but tell us a bit more. So Joao is the C CTO, but like who, who else is on the leadership team and like w what are the roles? Um, certainly, so um, the leadership team also evolved quite a bit over the years. Um, you know, at, at the pace that we grow, um, it's very hard, you know, like the, 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 sometimes the right people right at the beginning are not the right people once you reach a certain scale, right? You're constantly, 
uh, improving and growing. And, and you need to bring everybody along or find people that have the skill set to take you to the next level. Uh, I think right now, I mean, we have a really great uh, leadership team with a lot of experience. Uh, we have uh, Wolf as a CRO. So Wolf Alisad, he was the first em- employee Europe-wise of Omnitrue. He took that, took up 100 million, IPO'd. Uh, IPO'd three times. All his six previous startups were either sold or IPO. Like great, great experience on, on SaaS revenue. Uh, we have uh, Sophie, based in San Francisco, our CMO, um, that joined uh, last year. Um, you know, before, I mean, her experience is a lot on customer service and kind of taking platforms um, into deep customer service installations and how do you actually market that. Um, uh, it's been really amazing. We have Leah as, uh, uh, as our VP of people. Uh, so culture is super important to us and how do we actually, especially in this time where there's such magnitude shifts in tech companies' culture and how we're going to deal with the current environment. I think it's been very crucial. Um, we have uh, most recently James uh, as our CFO based in London. Uh, James um, had been before in Message Labs and helped them with the acquisition. He has a ton of uh, M&A experience and really helping high growth companies. Uh, and then we have Sebastian as our VP product. Uh, he came from One Fine Stay. And Okado, uh, you know, amazing, really amazing product guy from a systems perspective and like complex uh, products. Um, and then me as a CEO, and then uh, Anna, I have a chief of staff who, you know, who vastly extends my ability to do things, which has been really amazing. Got it. So you mentioned the whole, I mean, COVID, remote, etc. Like, how is it for you? Like, what are the pros and cons running a distributed team? Maybe if you can share what tools are you using to to do that? And, uh, you know, just your experience over the past, whatever, it's been 12 plus months, right? Yeah. I, you know, I have to say, we were not built as a remote uh, culture and Babel, right? I mean, like, um, even from the beginning, I mean, the, we officially decided to start the company during a surf trip. Uh you know, and that was been part of our DNA. Like even to this day on Thursday mornings in Lisbon, you just, you know, well, before COVID, a bus would pick you up. Now you have to actually get to the beach. But 730 at the beach, there's a lesson. Instructors, boards, suits, everybody on Babel is, you know, welcome to it. First timers, you know, people that serve for a long time. It's uh, it's something we continue to do. We do a lot of events, uh, retreats. It's, it, it's a very heavy um, culture on spending time together and, and, you know, co-located, co-located. And so we had to, as most other tech companies overnight switch to remote. And I think from a productivity perspective, that wasn't an issue. So things continue to function quite well. I think what we're seeing now is we did lose a bit of our culture, right? And, and it's an important mm. part and it's something that we need to get back. And so that's right now, I think is the, is the struggle is, well, I, I think there's an important part of our culture that has to do with us spending time together in a post COVID right now, it's a, a bit moot point because, you know, like we're not there yet, but we can see that kind of the light at the end of the tunnel. Right. And so what happens when we get there? Uh, what does the Babel look like from a culture perspective? Are we going to be a hybrid model where people are going to spend part of the time in the office? Are we going to be a continue to be a remote company? My gut is my gut feeling is that we're going to be a, a hybrid model, at least in the beginning. I think it's those interactions and serendipity that happens in the office is very important for us. Um, I don't think that uh, we have really been able to port that part of the culture to a remote first uh, experience. I think some companies are because they were built remote first, but that is not uh, the case with us. Um, and so for us, I mean, we've been using the standard things, you know, like you know, heavy, heavy Zoom, um, you know, just trying to be much more proactive in communication over Slack, over email, having things documented, trying to move to an asynchronous way of working. And some of that I think is very helpful and very valuable because um, I, I do think that, uh, you know, the, the the shift that we're seeing now, so halfway through the confinement, we were we were seeing already, look, there's there's it's naive to think that there won't be a strong impact of this, right? So we're not going to be able to go back to things as they were before, but what does the future mm-hmm. look like? And what we've done is we've embraced what we're calling a hubs policy. And so we've, we've officially declared hubs, uh, some of the offices that we had already, so Lisbon, San Francisco, New York, Pittsburgh, but we also opened up a hub in London and Berlin. Um, and what this means is every hiring manager can hire for a position that they're hiring in any of the hubs, right? Like any of the hubs, fair game. If you want to hire outside of the hubs, then we need to think about it carefully because if we hire, if we're now hire, let's say 40 people randomly, you know, across the world, and effectively we are committing to a remote 
culture. And so we want to keep it within certain locations. And then I think what will happen is hubs eventually will all have offices and they will serve as focal points for people to have, you know, uh, events, uh, moments together as a team. But it doesn't mean that that those are the people going to be working with. So your team might be spread around hubs. And so the day to day experience might be more remote than there were before. Got to say, that sounds a lot more compelling to me than like when I read a couple of weeks ago that Coinbase went f like remote. They basically said, we're shutting down our San Francisco office and we're going to go like just distributed, fully remote. And I keep thinking it's it's hard to do this really at scale. I mean, it's later. We're fully remote. We're a team of a dozen people, of course, but but, but we also like to meet at our conferences like three, four times a year, right? So this kind of gives you, um, you know, way to share, but what you're describing there with the hub, that, that sounds like very good, smart solution going forward. Yeah. And um, I think, you know, that both, both ways are very valid, right? There's, I think if you set up a structure in a way that is remote first, you tend to attract also people that really enjoy that and really thrive in that, hmm. in that environment. And that's perfectly fine. I mean, GitLab has a thousand people that are all remote, Atlassian, they're all remote. It, it works. But there's also other people that like the separation of office and private space that like to be able to see people in an office and have a space they go to that like that. I think now people like that flexibility of not having to be there every every day, but to be there maybe two, three times a week where they can take a break. I, I, I noticed that um, a lot of times people with kids actually are, you know, in our at least in our organization, people with kids are more likely to right now want to come to the office, you know, because they kind of need that separation uh, yeah. and they feel that, you know, um, and so we've been seeing that like in general, as we've been doing po polls and surveys inside of Babel, and people started from remote and now they're starting to migrate to actually what I want is two, three days a week to have a, a place that I can go to. Mm. Yeah. And, and sticking with the idea of hiring and, and finding talent, um, how, how have you found it trying to hire and retain this uh, hyper-competitive roles of machine learning and, and, and computer science. I mean, maybe the hub setup also helps with that, but what, what's your experience been of, of that kind of, those roles in your business? Um, it's been a, sh a big shift um, over the last few years. Right? So, mm -hmm. for example, I think we benefited from this concept that, you know, Portugal was a bit of an undiscovered jewel where you had a lot of really great technical, ta technical talent, uh, but you know, it had been explored nearly to the, you know, like not that much, like seven years ago. And I think in the last seven years, that certainly changed, right? So we are going after the top 1% of, of, of talent globally. And in AI, that means competing with Facebook and Google and, you know, DeepMind and a bunch of other companies. Mm. Um, and I think especially now with COVID, what this does is, you know, physical barriers are much lower, right? And so people, all our people have multiple offers from all the companies. And so I think on one hand, this creates pressure to provide a basic set of conditions from, you know, a, a package perspective that you just need to be competitive. And then on top of that, it you need to find the people that really fit with our culture, you know, that that really believe in the mission, that feel that it's, it's uh, you know, it's about what they're doing. Uh, some people really prefer smaller teams. Some people really prefer, um, you know, the kind of work that we do and the challenges that we solve. Um, I think within AI, there is a, a myriad of challenges to be solved, right? And some people are very much vision focused or they're, you know, they're processes driven. While if you want to work in um, translation, machine translation, in AI applied to, you know, quality estimation, like there's not that many places in the world that are actually doing mm. proper research that are going all the way from um, high end research to very core applications to having their work going from research to customers in three or four weeks. Uh, and so that mm -hmm. environment appeals to a certain set of people that, that you know, then, then do really well here. Mm. Well, and tell us a bit more about the startup environment. What's it like in Portugal? How would you say that the differences are compared to the US and, and Europe generally? How does that, how does that differ from, from the US? Yeah. Ooh. Um, so, uh, I, you know, overall, I'm very bullish when it comes to Lisbon. I think I have this whole thesis, right, where uh, I think there's the macro Europe versus the U.S. And um, the U.S. has uh, a sense of belief that is sometimes is harder to find in Europe. It's changing slowly because you're starting to have unicorns and a strong uh, startup ecosystem. And, you know, but it takes a while. 
I think uh, the US, it just, it's almost like a, there's a, a stronger reality distortion field, you know, of the ability to just believe on things that are going to work out and we're going to happen. And, and that creates an environment that becomes very conducive to risk and innovation. But if you look specifically in San Francisco versus uh, other places in the world, um, for example, when it comes to Europe and the US, I would compare London and New York. Uh, and, and what you see there is two cities that are amazing, that are thriving, uh, but they will never be startup cities, you know, because they do have a lot of really great startups, but there's also a lot of other competing industries. Uh, you know, there's finance, there's fashion, there's, you know, a lot of other things. And so mm. the city doesn't focus all of its resources and attention to tech uh, and focus on a bunch of things. San Francisco and the Bay Area has that, right? There's this insane critical mass of people that, you know, everyone decided that this is what we're going to care about, right? And and the benefit of that is has really been accumulated over the years. And so it, it, it feels, um, it feels, highly energized you know people I, I compare san francisco a bit like in my imagination it's a bit like um florence in the renaissance you know like people move all over the world there to be part of the early conversations and if you think about a lot of the really meaningful conversations on automation on ai on uh you know social experiments a lot of times are happening there right and i see that then those conversations percolate and maybe a few months later you're having them again in other places when it comes to lisbon obviously it's a much much smaller environment the one benefit is I think we we have some like we also don't have competing industries that much. And so I think the city really embraced uh, tech over the last uh, few years and that that created a very, very positive feedback loop. Um, I think we have good technical talent, you know, like the weather is great. Like there's a good like you can have a really good life here. It's vibrant. There's you know, you go out at night. There's all of those things that attract talent that wants to also have a good life, like have an interesting, you know, vibrant life. San Francisco is on a different level. And I think where you see that is it's, it's easier to become a big fish in a small pond in Lisbon, you know, and you need to, to not have that mentality from day zero. And I think one of the great things about San Francisco is it puts you in a position of discomfort more often, right? It's like, it, it constantly reminds you how small of a fish you are and how big the pond really is. And, and, and in a way that is more uncomfortable, but on the other end, it kind of propels you uh, to bigger you know, to bigger limits, I think. What's your take on this whole people going to Austin and to Miami over the past six months? Like my Twitter feed is lit up with everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people going to these two cities. Startups. Uh, I, I, you know, like, I, I don't think Miami is going to be a startup city. Austin, I don't know, maybe. Um, I, I think, so I, I saw that wave, but now what I'm seeing from my friends is, is kind of hashtag San Francisco is well and in, in, in live, right? And so on one end, you have companies like Coinbase and, you know, a bunch of others that were like, oh, we're leaving San Francisco, uh, Salesforce, let's see what's going to happen, Salesforce Tower, Twitter, uh, you know, but others that are saying like Twilio says, no, no, we're we're staying here. We're like very committed to the Bay Area in San Francisco. Google has continued to invest like 14 billion in complexes around the, the Bay Area. So, you know, there's going to be a shift. I, I don't think that I haven't seen yet an ecosystem that can compete with the Bay Area in San Francisco when it comes to, but it could be that in 10 years, people leave. What, what, what I'm seeing is what I don't believe is this idea that people are going to abandon cities, right? Which was kind of halfway through COVID. We're like, yeah, look, everyone's now remote and they're going to live in the no. middle of nowhere. And I think cities continue to have the, the fundamental reasons why there's actually what was, has been a big migration towards cities. Those reasons are still there, right? You're, you have just the ability to have um, serendipity in a city of just a generation of idea of ideas of having collaboration of of access to culture of access to entertainment like all of that is going to like the even from a carbon footprint perspective cities are much more efficient you know you don't you know the idea of not having to to use a car all the time those are things that are continuing to attract people uh, towards cities now I I do think San Francisco in particular has a bit of a problem you know like. Uh, it's it's a bit jarring when you're in San Francisco, the homeless situation, for example, and uh, and that is, I think is starting to have an impact where people are saying, hey, look, I, I don't want to live in a place where like, why can't we do this better? Right. I mean, the, like it's one of the rich, richest cities in the world. Why is this happening? And I think the lack of ability to really make advances in that in that problem, I think, might have more of an impact than COVID, because ultimately, I think what people are going to want is still a city, still vibrant, still, you know, generation and 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 
and, uh, and, and connections with different ideas, but in a place that they feel safe, that they enjoy, that they can have a vibrant, good life. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Going back to the translation part here, uh, we, we talk a lot about, we hear a lot about, we're using the human in the loop, right? And Umbabel is at the forefront there. Like we, I started to relabel it to like expert in the loop because uh, if you want to add uh, value to current machine translation, you probably better be an expert, not just a human. Um, but how do you, I, I mean, love can that. you just describe? That's a great like, how expression do... <laughs> actually. Expert in the loop. <laughs> I'm going yeah, to, I'm going to start let's... using it and, and quoting you on that. Good, good, good. Yeah, let's let's uh, move the conversation towards there. Uh, no, but I mean it's true, right? I mean, if if I'm looking at some some of the output now of, of machine translation, I mean, yeah, you, you got to you got to know your stuff to add value to that. If you're just a, a, like an you know average user, like this, it's hard for you to even find what's what's wrong anymore there. So how do you approach it? Like, how do people interact with MT in, in your system? And I know, I mean, I know from some research paper I've read, like you're very, like you, you count like uh, keystrokes and like you have a very, very kind of meticulous tech approach to this. Just give, give us a sense how, how the linguists uh, 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 interact with MT. So um, it's, it, um, as with language, generalization is hard, right? And so what we see is depending on content type. So if you take a chat, versus an email, versus a blog, versus, um, you know, and you kind of, if you go up the chain of um, how many people are going to read that content and the amount of time that someone spends creating that content, um, the more you need human intervention to be able to do a proper translation. Uh, and so the curves are, it's not one curve, it's actually multiple curves. And also then there's another dimension of language pair, right? So. Uh, AI is much more developed English to Spanish than it is English to Turkish, for example. And hmm. if you go, you know, Chinese to Turkish, then you know you need to go through English a lot of times, which adds a lot more complexity and errors. So that's the other dimension: language pair, content type. Uh, those tend to create very different experiences, and the the impact that AI has, and and by by relation, the the ability for humans to have an impact in the output of AI. Um, and so what we see is, I think chat we're seeing already, we're kind of in a point where, uh, you know, with um, adaptation, you know, for us, for example, in the case of chat, uh, the linguists are kind of behind the scenes, constantly improving the engine, but actually in production is the engine that is being used. You know, they're just, mm -hmm. so the humans are not in the loop there in the sense of having a check with humans before delivering because in chat you need real time. And so there's constraints there. But AI has gone to the point where if you do adaptation, if you have a continuous adaptation process, then you can, you know, you can, you can deal with a lot of the, of, of the chat uh, uh, needs. I think when it comes to email, for example, what we're seeing is 70% of emails still need some sort of human interaction, right? And a lot of, and it could be very little, right? It could be just correcting a couple of things. And mostly it's because machine translation engines still work on a sentence by sentence base. And so once you have multiple sentences, the probability of errors just goes up uh, quite a bit. And so you might have inconsistencies across sentences. Maybe one sentence comes out a bit more formal or it's more of the fine tuning. If you go into marketing, mm -hmm. you start getting into more of the traditional translate review process where you have two humans in the loop, you know, one to do the translation. And, and there, um, you know, it's it has to do more with uh, either expertise on particular topics or uh, cultural adaptation and tone uh, that you still end up having a bit. Like, for example, if you translate uh, with Google Translate, they don't have translation to Port European Portuguese. They only have to Brazilian Portuguese, uh, right? So it's it's things like that where it's just, it's data related. And so you, once you want to uh, speak in behalf of a brand, um, and you're translating someone that has all the brand knowledge, you need to have a lot of humans involved to do that too. What are some of the challenges that, that you see when you're trying to scale this kind of, um, you know, advanced technology into the enterprise systems, these real life scenarios in companies that might be more, have more kind of uh, bespoke or legacy setups? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's quite a few, um, but also they've been changing a lot. So I think, mm. you know, five years ago, um, you'd say anything AI, machine translation, and there was a very strong reaction against it when it came to translation. It was like, oh, wait, no. Now that is certainly 
is changing, right? So companies are much more open. They've seen it. They, a lot of people interacted with it. They're they're seeing they're they're buying into it and saying, look, yep, the results are here, and I think it's 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 now becoming a viable solution, or at least we need to consider it as part of the of the solution because the, the you have a lot of uh, impact. Um, I think that there's a few challenges. One is there's still a lot of legacy systems, as you say, so integrations um, at the level that we want them to uh, work, which is very seamless. You know, translation as a layer should be almost invisible, right? You should be able to just speak normally and the other person should just understand you without having to actually pay attention to the fact that there was a translation that shouldn't exist, right? And so in order to do that, you need almost native integrations into the content systems, whether it's, you know, in the case of customer service, things like CRMs, like Zendesk and Salesforce and, you know, and Dynamics mm -hmm. and so on. But also if you go into marketing, you know, Marketos and Pardos and HubSpots and such that your the end user has a seamless experience. And so there is a challenge there. There is a lot of times the change management part of the company. So when you ha add a technology that is disruptive and enables you to do things in a fundamental different way, that means that you need to change the way you're doing things. And there's change management involved in that. And that always has some inertia. I mean, COVID in a lot of ways accelerated the digital transformation of companies. And so in, mm -hmm. in a way that that's been um, th that's been positive. But it's still we're still talking about changing, you know, core processes of customer service or marketing or how things happen. And so that uh, sometimes is a challenge. I think uh, the third is more on, you know, the pace of rapid evolution of technology is increasing in itself. Right. And so how do you continue to be at the forefront when, you know, there's pressure on all sides, but at the same time, you're trying to in our case, build a really uh, vertical, vertically integrated end-to-end -end system uh, that is able to deliver, you know, you know, the whole package to a customer as a solution. I think that's constantly a challenge as a startup because, um, you know, you're 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 investing in a lot of different areas. So we have a big surface area of tech that we need to continue to develop, and so mm -hmm. doing that in a way that's still competitive at all levels. You know, if you think about it, in Babel, we need to develop. A machine translation engine that is at least as good as DeepL or Google Translate. We need to develop an AI first TMS that is at least as good as Trotto's or anything out there. We need to develop a, you know, a, 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 an experience for uh, the translator that is at least as good as Gengo or any other company that focuses on on crowd, you know, and so on. Right? Every component needs to be best of breed, competing to a bunch of with a bunch of other companies that also are developing just those components, right? And so that's definitely mm. a challenge, but it's a fun one. Talking about staying ahead of the curve, what, what's your take on all this NLP uh, that's coming out, like GPT-3, I've subscribed to Copy AI, I'm using it, I still can't really wrap my head around if I'm ever gonna use it in real life, but like there's just so much going on with these kind of large language models. Is that something that you guys are really looking at and, and incorporating or? We are in some areas. So uh, certainly the um, the work we've done on Comet and the so new framework for evaluation of machine translation that has been beating every benchmark out there, um, it, it benefited from large language models. Um, and, and so we're seeing the impact on the ability to generate fluidity. I still think though that we're kind of a bit in the uncanny valley territory, right? It's like things are quite good but it, they have the reaction that you were saying, right? It's like, I don't know if I'm gonna use them on a daily basis. I think in a couple of iterations, we will, right? It's just, we haven't quite figured out how to incorporate them very easily. And I think there's, uh, well, what I expect to see is that we're gonna start seeing really innovative ways of using them, you know, in ways that mm -hmm. maybe we hadn't really thought about before. Uh, and, and so I haven't seen yet the killer app for GPT-3, um, but I've seen some apps that I'm thinking, Okay, like it's almost there, right? It's it's almost there. That being said, in language, the almost there sometimes, you know, like the it's it's really the case of the first ninety percent taking ninety percent of the time, and then the less ten percent taking the other ninety percent of the time. So we'll see how that evolves. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I've been playing around with this. I'm like kind of useful, but like like I don't know how I really could use it right now. It's like it's not writing my article yet and it's not writing my headlines yet. Um but yeah, it's certainly certainly interesting. Hey, you mentioned uh James Palmer, right? He's based in London. Is that is that correct? Yes. Yeah, you you recently hired uh, him as a CFO and what's the um 
kind of stuck out to me there that you mentioned that there's some apparently some M and A strategy in the work. And also in his LinkedIn profile, it says that he's responsible for finance planning and M and A. Is there anything you can say around that? Because we just before on the on the previous segment here, we spoke about Verbit, uh, also AI agency in the transcription side acquiring a captioning firm. So, uh, or you know, what's what's your planning around M and A? Well, I think um, you know until now. Uh, we were very focused in, um, you know, in one use case, and now we're starting that journey of expansion throughout other use cases. And I think the next phase for us uh, is going to mean that we start having real options and build versus buy, and how do we think about, uh, you know, expanding to different areas. And so, at this point, it's more of a, hey, it's great to have someone with that experience on board. Uh, we don't have a specific acquisition that we're uh, targeting. But we're starting to really consider our options as we continue to develop the company on, you know, what what makes sense in each case. Uh, I do think that, um, you know, as part of a growth of, of a company like ours, at, at some point M and A is is a very important strategy, uh, and so having the resources that can really, you know, lead that I think is very important. Um, and uh, it, it's a bit like, you know, like uh, sometimes people ask me, everyone's very excited about like. Are you guys a unicorn? And when are you IPOing? And I, you know, I always say, look, this is those are not the goals, right? I mean, like they are most likely stages that we'll go through. If you want to build a big global company that solves a meaningful problem, you know, you're most likely going to go through those stages. At some point, you're going to IPO, etc. But that's not the goal, right? Those are just things that happen along the way. So it's good to have the resources that enable you to go through those stages, um, but they will happen, you know, when it makes sense. Mm. And, and you've got a number of different investors on, on board already. Um, and I mean, what's it work? What's it like working with somebody like Shri, uh, who has a deep understanding of the industry dynamics? Yeah, I, look, I have to say that, you know, we were, I, I and everyone as a team was fascinated when we started interacting with Point72 and Shri in particular. And mm. I'm saying this because I think Shri was the first time that I've talked to an investor that actually told me things about my market that I didn't know and about my, you know, the what I was trying to solve. And that's very rare. And it's and it's not expected. Right. I mean, most investors like if I think about uh, Chris Totman led our series A or Andy Vitas led our series B, they're all amazing investors in different ways. You know, Chris is amazing with go to market and sales and kind of the early stage stuff. Uh, Andy is really great at process and structure and kind of how do you how do you really keep focus on on you know on growth um they bring a lot of value to the table shri on top of that also has very interesting thesis on how the market is going to evolve and how can we unlock opportunities in ways that i hadn't thought about before um mm. and so you know most investors would tell you hey we're here to help but you need to build your business um and it's rare when an investor on top of that actually gives you insight on how to build your business uh, beyond uh, pattern matching right so a lot of the benefit that you have from investors besides capital is this ability of seeing a lot of things, right? They, they have this, this great pattern matching on seeing other companies go through similar issues. Uh, and, and, and a lot of times what you see is early on, every company is kind of different. So finding product market fit, everyone's building a slightly different product and a slightly different market. And, and so it, you know, challenges are all different. And then once you get to about 70 to 100 people, most companies have the same challenges. It's all about how do I scale engineering? How do I scale finance? How do I scale my go to market? And, and that becomes, you know, pattern matching becomes much more useful because they apply to a wider, you know, array of, of companies. Um, so it's, it's been great. I think our investors continue to not only bring a lot of value, but, but keep us focused on the big picture. And I think that's, that's an important thing because as you're developing a startup, it's very easy to get in the trenches, you know, and to be just focused on the the mm. the, the challenge in front of you, uh, and so it, it's good to have kind of strong reminders of like, no, look, we're building this big thing, and that's the expectation. Yeah. So for for those of you listening to that who want to go back, and uh, you can look at the write up with it from San Francisco SlaterCon 2019, where Shri was on a panel. So uh, just just putting that in here. Uh, well, closing this on the outlook, what's your outlook for kind of the language industry as a whole? And, and just generally, what are some of the most exciting things you're working on at the moment at Unbubble? So um, the most exciting thing that for me that we're working on is actually the 
you know, the, the language operations platform. And I, I think for a lot of people, you know, maybe this is a fairly obvious thing, uh, but for me, um, you know, this idea of, of a category that really enables the growth of localization in a way, the transformation that I saw with uh, sysadmins becoming DevOps as cloud came in and the impact it had on how companies really think about infrastructure, I'm seeing the same shift happening uh, in companies and how they see language, right? And, and, and language operations kind of capturing that the, as the evolution of localization. So going from a siloed mm. approach to something that has really structured uh, and strategic value for a company as they scale. And I think it, it makes a lot of sense because, um, you know, as, as, as physical barriers came down more and more, especially with COVID, things like language become a bigger barrier, right? It, it becomes more obvious that why is it that, you know, even in very simple examples, why is it that, you know, if I were to ask, you know, about famous Chinese singers or famous Chinese writers, we probably don't know very much. At least I don't, right? And I mean, you lived in China, so maybe you, you know way more. But but in general, people don't. Eh? But in general, if you ask famous American singers or writers, people will know them, right? And it's this dissemination of content, it's dissemination of ideas. And that applies at all levels, including companies, brands, uh, you know, content creators. And the big hurdle there is language, right? If you think about China as a 1.5 billion people country, I'm sure there's the average ratio of great writers to number of citizens the same as in the US or Portugal or Brazil or any other country, right? And yet it's this this weird language barriers that create you know inability for us to access knowledge, content, ideas, products, services. And we see that really happening you know, across the entire spectrum. Like customer service is a simple but powerful example. If you happen to be born in a country that, you know, you don't speak English, your access to customer service is way worse than if you are, if you do speak English, right? If I want to call British Airways, you know, in the US, I have a 24 seven line open. If I want to call them from Portugal, it's five days a week, nine to five, right? And that's a very simple example. Other countries, you won't be able to, right? And so, how do we actually, I mean, now that we've solved a lot of logistic issues, like, uh, you know, how do we ship something? How do we build something? And we can do it easily from anywhere in the world to anywhere in the world. I think solving language as a barrier is an even bigger uh, uh, challenge and will have an even bigger impact. Um, and I think we can do it. So I'm very excited about that. There you go. I think we can do it. That's the... Uh... The San Very Francisco cool. side. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, uh, thanks so much for taking the time today, Vasco. It was fascinating talking to you. And uh, hope to get you at one of our conferences at some point, IRL, in the future. Thank you very much. I look forward to it. And it was great to be here. Thanks very Cheers. much. Bye-bye.